Today's episode of In the Trenches is brought to you by System 12 Guitar Method. Sign up today at RyanRoxy.com. In the Trenches with Ryan Roxy. Hello, 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 and welcome to another live stream episode of In the Trenches. I am your host, Ryan Roxy. What is happening? Uh, well, it's summertime, as you can see. It looks like I just jumped out of the pool, but the uh, as I was told by our guest today. or But what I actually was doing was taking my weekly shower, my pandemic weekly shower. That's what we've been doing every single Thursday or Tuesday. Whenever you're watching this, it's whatever day it is, right? Welcome to In the Trenches. And if you are listening to us on an audio broadcast, maybe you're listening to us on Apple or Stitcher or Spotify, thank you very much for doing that. But where we really want you is in the live chat. And we want you on the YouTube official, Ryan Roxy official YouTube channel. So hit that subscribe button if you can right now and hit that, uh, get in the chat, be part of it. Because I see the faithful, the In the Trenches faithful is there showing up. And why shouldn't you? Today's a big day, man. It's a big day in the North, as they would say. So here we go. Welcome to In the Trenches. There's only a couple guys that I see walking around in Stockholm that truly exemplify rock and roll. Dragon from the Backyard Babies, Stevie Clausen from Johnny Thunder's band, and our guest that we have on today. He's got that he's cool vibe going on. You know, it's the one when you walk out and you go, yeah, he's cool. I want to be like that guy. Well, he's got that cool vibe, vibe but he backs it up with his ferocious guitar playing. And did I mention he can sing his ass off too? Here to talk about his band's seventh studio album release, Upside Down, would you please welcome Into the Trenches, lead guitarist and frontman of the band Electric Boys, Connie Bloom. Hello, Connie. Thank you, Ryan. That was How a about sweet that? introduction. <laughs> it was a nice introduction, right? Yeah, I mean... I always try to write something that I would want to hear about myself or something that I would like to like, Hey, Hey, he, he, he didn't do, he did a little bit more than go on to Wikipedia and read. Although I did go on to Wikipedia and read your site. You need to update the, uh, the, the new album because upside down, which we're going to dive right into is not on your Connie Bloom site. Just so you know. Uh, okay. So who's Thank ever, you. Whoever wants to volunteer to update Connie's Wikipedia site right now, you can add the, and I'm, am I right saying seventh studio album? I think so, yeah. Yeah. So I have all of them here, and but we're going to talk about number seven right now, Upside Down, because you just released it um, this year. There's the copy of it right now. Uh, when did you do it, and how are you releasing it, and what are you doing that's different than prior releases that you've had on all uh, other Electric Boys albums? Um, I don't know. The difference might be that we try to work a little bit faster this time. Uh, when the whole pandemic uh, started, it, it was kind of like, okay, what do we do now? Sit around and... Uh, do nothing or try to stay creative or whatever and, and we decided let's uh i don't know i just wrote it went into like a, a really you know writing mode started working and making lots of demos and then um and um and then we did the album and the idea was to make it a little bit faster you know have a little bit more of a, uh to you know to, to save some of Keep some of the edge, so to speak, not not okay. overproduce it too much. And I think I think that's how it came out. I'm really pleased with it. But usually in the summer times, you guys, Electric Boys, are are pretty much booked on festivals, and you're doing uh, around Sweden or whether it's around Europe or whether it's around the world. You guys are doing um, a lot of different touring. This you didn't have that option to do it in 2020. So. Yeah. Well, you guys did something a little bit different, which I thought was cool, is that you, you know, you recorded a concert film during this time. And, and that's part of your promotion for all of this. And how did that come about? And whose idea was that? Well, that came from uh, our, our new booking agent, uh, um, Hilda at MTA. And, um, and um, 
I don't know. I think I think that was another idea, you know, just to try to think outside of the box and uh, you know just stay creative. And if we can't do this, then maybe we can do that, you know, that sort of thing. Yeah. And um, and we needed to shoot a video, and we wanted to do like a performance video anyway. So so we were talking about renting this place, and then this whole thing came together. Why why don't we just record a whole concert and then etc. So yeah, that's how it happened. Well, I mean, doing those live stream concerts, it's it's something about it. It's tough. I I've I did this thing called live uh, Sunday live stream Sunday, and um, you you were part of it when we did uh, one of the songs on one of our last episodes. We did uh, "Can't Put Your Arms Around a Memory," and yeah. um, I'm not sure what Vic just put up right now, but I think that was the website for finding the album right now so if people want to go check it out right now this is for finding the newest album upside down and you can find also the uh live concert footage Vic, you want to put that up again for me so i know what's going on there it is all right and is that at electricboys.com where is it yeah and that's for the um that's the ad for the concert film okay i got you i got you that, and when you and when you guys did it, did it, did you? Um, <laughs> how was it to 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 sort of put in your uh, your inner live show when you're just playing in front of a camera? Was it like shooting? Was it was it the same as shooting a music video, or did you have to go into a different headspace when you do the live concert? Well, I mean, the way I, I I'm not a big fan of live stream concerts, to be honest. I mean, I've done a few, especially with the solo stuff, but. Um, it's a weird thing of it's like they tell you to pretend that it's a concert but it's not and and it's not like you're making a video where you're like performing for the for the camera like that either because at least for me they've told me not not to worry about the camera just pretend that there's an audience <laughs> so right right i'm thinking of rick nielsen he once said when he was when they were showing some video he said he, does, he didn't really like it because he said i'm I'm a. I'm not an actor. I'm a reactor. I thought that was a good, good saying because it's. I don't know. It's kind of weird. But but this time, just because we um, were also shooting a video at the same time, um, it it didn't feel like a live stream. It. I guess we sort of fooled ourselves. So it, it was like <laughs> we were actually really enjoying having everything set up on a big stage and, and running through the. The set list, you know. I love it. Well, some now, filmed it, but uh, we we were just enjoying doing that again. So it was it was okay. The ahead. hardest thing is is in between songs when you're doing something like that because the the biggest event of all the live streams that I saw, I think, throughout the whole pandemic, and and you know, knock on wood, it's all uh, coming back to live shows. I know I have some uh, live shows with Alice already, you know, on paper, tickets getting sold September, October, and hopefully Electric Boys have some dates already lined up as well uh, for, for live shows. But the biggest production that I had seen of all those live streams was Corey Taylor's. Uh, live stream that he did from the LA forum and I enjoyed it and I liked it because obviously at the time there had been s no live music. So this was kind of a close thing, the closest thing to a worldwide event that they could put on at the time. The yeah. thing that struck me that was different is in between songs. Like what did you, do? what do you do in between songs? Because you're not at a live show. So you can't get like Rick Nielsen said that reaction from the crowd, but you have to act like they're reacting anyway, right? And how did you, how did you handle in between song banter? We came up with a really smart thing, which was to put some of the songs together, and uh, the songs that wouldn't be together, we just added little documentary clips, uh -huh. and and called it a concert film instead of a live stream. <laughs> so you, so all the so all the awkward silence in between songs is left on the cutting room floor well yeah. played bloom i, know. I mean that's well. the that's the worst part <laughs> and also we were, we were talking about this backstage when we were shooting this that how exhausting it is to because you're giving and giving and you get nothing back you know like I mean, we were doing this for for i don't know how many hours 
came came there early in the morning and went on till late at night and we were on stage playing all the time apart from some short coffee breaks but but uh just stay I mean, if, if you're if you're doing a three hour show like Bruce Springsteen or whatever, if you have an audience that are singing, singing along and giving you all that energy back, you, you can go on forever. But if you don't, if you don't, if you're just giving it nothing back. I think that's the way me and my team from In the Trenches feel about YouTube right now, just at this point in our careers, because we give and we give and we try and put as, as much of a of a of a good show product out. And what we feel is that at least at least a hundred thousand people should be watching this every week, but yeah. right now they're not. So yeah. I kind of feel I, I feel the pain. But guess what? The people that are in the trenches right now, in the chat right now, uh, thank you very much for being there on the ground floor of this because we've been going on now. This is our, uh, I guess, our eighty second episode or eighty first episode. Vic will help us out with that. What is it? Eighty one or eighty two? He's just shrugging his shoulders. He's just going, you know what? I don't have a graphic for that, Ryan. I don't have a graphic. But the deal is, I feel it because sometimes you put so much, you give, you give, you give, and all we want is a bigger audience. And we're growing. So anyway, if you're watching this right now, tell 10 of your friends. And if you're an Electric Boys fan, um, then you know. We're here with Connie Bloom right now talking about the new album, Upside Down, uh, released this year. Um, let me ask you this. Whose friggin' idea was it to put the exclamation point instead of an I? And does that mess up your Spotify search when someone searches to go see hear the new album? Uh, <laughs> good question. <laughs> I, think, I think it was my idea. Um, I'm not sure. But the thing was that where, where the title came from was actually I found um, um, a Coca-Cola... What, what do you call it? The top of the from the bottle. Yeah, bottle cap. Yeah, if it's the the glass, if it's the glass one, there's there's usually a little message underneath, and and it said upside down, and it was lying up, upside down on on the table, and I just took a picture and I thought this is a really cool uh, cover, but then uh, and then we expanded on that and came up with this other idea. Uh, but I think that's where it came from, that to, to play around with the Upside Down, that to, not to have the title Upside Down. It would be like the Aerosmith album, uh, Done With Mirrors, where it's yeah. all backwards. That and, was the most confusing album. I know. But I, it was probably confusing for them, too, because that was sort of their comeback album when they were just dipping their toe into reforming. Do you remember that record? I do remember, and and I thought it was a cool cover. But I remember them saying, I think there was an interview with with Tom Hamilton when he said it's the, it must be the most <laughs> like, stupid cover to me. I mean, <laughs> it, it was a weird. I loved it. I thought it was really cool. But, but I remember that album had a, had a, didn't it have also Aerosmith's version of "Let the Music Do the Talk" and not Joe Perry's version, but actually okay. a version of Stephen Stephen Tyler singing it. And a lot of those songs on that album, I think, faded because they didn't have they were they didn't have they hadn't properly like finished the arrangements of all those songs. So a lot of those tunes that are on that album, if you listen to it, fade out because they just didn't come up with endings or, or like maybe a proper, proper full arrangement. Because obviously the album after that, which was Permanent Vacation, right, that yeah. was their that was their step in and all of a sudden John Kladner would made put his stamp on it. But didn't John Kladner produce Done With Mirrors as well? I'm I don't not remember sure. that. But it, you it know, sure was a big step up. I thought, you know, when Permanent Vacation came, it was like a, it was like that. It was perfect. I know. I, I, well, but, but, but anyway, be honest. Uh, speaking of the title, it's like I, I did remember that discussion <laughs> that I read that they thought, oh, maybe it wasn't such a great idea. So I would figure, <laughs> okay, let's not write this upside down. Let's not write upside down. But, but <laughs> somebody put the idea of putting an exclamation point after yeah, instead I, of the I. I. Think I did. Because I have something that would be upside down, but not not everything. <laughs> you had to get your little Aerosmith in there somehow, you know. I remember yeah. that. 
The thing I love about this show is that we have a live chat, folks, and if you are listening to us on the live stream, they will tell us if uh, Done With Mirrors, Harris Smith, was produced by John Kolodner because someone will go on the Internet and figure it out right away. But I think it was, but then obviously Permanent Vacation came out and then Pump came out. And my question to you is, because I'm always the older school guy, old Aerosmith, new Aerosmith, because there's certain bands that have that sort of break in their career. And Electric Boys is no different, to be honest, and I'll talk about that in a second. But first question, old Aerosmith or, or sort of the reinvented new Aerosmith? I, w- I would have to say uh, old Aerosmith, because I think, I mean, for me, rocks, especially rocks, but some of the other stuff as well. But that's it's such a classic, and and um, but it's a it's difficult. It's a good question, but it's difficult to answer anyway. Because I think w- what they did with permanent vacation and and pump when they came back was was really really good. Right. So it's it's like two different things, really. All right. So then the next one is old ACDC or new ACDC. It depends on what you mean, new ACDC. Would that be Brian Johnson? <laughs> yes, of course. Yeah, even though new ACDC is like 30 years old at this yeah. point, 30, 40 years old. But but Bon Scott or, uh, you know, Brian? Um, Toss up. I don't want to, you know, I, I love them both. I think they're, they're great. They're, they're great in different ways. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I just love how they came back, you know, after Bon Scott's death. And people obviously thought that this this is going nowhere. It, it's impossible to replace him. And then they came back and did back in black. Some, like, something even bigger, yeah. Something yeah, even bigger. Like one, it's probably I mean it's the like the biggest selling rock album, right? I mean yeah, one, as far as far as commercial success, definitely something even bigger. But for me, I you know, Bon Scott, the lyrics of Bon Scott, he was always one of the best lyricists, you know, of our time. That and, I agree. Okay. That I agree with. I mean, that's some uh, real street poetry there for you. Some really good. <laughs> but see, I, got, I, I, got I have this to... question. Go ahead. It's like, he goes, I got patches on my patches on my new blue jeans. Well, they used to be new when they used to be blue when they used to be clean. Holy shit. Are you just fucking spouting off Bon Scott lyrics? Yeah, nice man. done. Love but that's it. the only one I remember. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, and and you did a visual with it. I like that. Yeah. Sorry, I, I almost interrupted you with it. That's great. But I have this conversation, Connie, it, and it, it kind of goes back when I have it with European rockers or I have it with American rockers. Usually the American rockers always go with the older version of that band. But a lot of European you know, rockers go with this new age and the same could be said with Alice Cooper. And that's so, you know, that's part of the reason. And we're going to get that and get to that in just a little bit with going back to get forward is that Alice Cooper was a huge influence for electric boys. And you actually said that perhaps if it wasn't for Alice Cooper, there might not be an electric boys band. No, that's true. Because, um, when I was in school when I was about 13 and 14 years old, I saw this long haired guy, um, looked like a rock and roller, obviously, and and we started talking at some point, and it turned out that that he, just like I uh, was, um, was a was a big Alice Cooper fan. So that's how we became friends. And uh, so, yeah, in a way, if if it wouldn't be for Alice, there wouldn't be electric <laughs> electric boys. Maybe it would it would certainly be different because it wouldn't be. With with the two of us, uh, and we and we are talking about the bassist, the current bassist, and yeah. and always been the bassist of Electric Boys, Andy Christel. So, um, what back in those days was it the old Alice Cooper, or I would say new Alice Cooper in the Poison era, or was it the seventies old Alice Cooper? This was the old. I mean, uh, this was a long time ago. We got to remember. So, <laughs> I mean, I grew up when I was nine years old. I bought my first uh, album. Like, you know, I, I, there was all this music around me all the time, the Beatles and Little Richard and, and 50s rock and roll. But then when I, the first album I bought for my own money was, was Killer. And I was only nine years old. So, so I remember hearing, I got that and I remember hearing Schools Out and um, some other stuff around that era, which really changed everything. Because, I mean, I love Beatles and all that, but this was something different. 
And also, I like the fact that it pissed my mom off when I showed the pictures of him hanging himself Shocking. and chopping his head off. <laughs> <laughs> Somehow, folks, if you're just tuning into In the Trenches, we slipped into a little going bad to get forward without the animation. But don't worry, it's coming right up right now because we are here with guitarist, lead singer of Electric Boys, Connie Bloom. We are talking about the new album, Upside Down. Of course, we had that covered. We'll bring it up again later on in the podcast. But you know what? Being that we slid right into it, let's see the animation for it. Let's go back to get forward. So that's what, this is the part of the podcast where we sort of go back and find out the inspirations of how you got started. And um, you kind of touched upon that as well. I wanted to obviously drop Alice Cooper's name in there because he is a big part of not just your uh, existence with Electric Boys. He's a big part of the reason why I'm able to actually make a living and see the world and actually end up here in Sweden with you. Um, but I want to go back to when you first started and uh, you started playing because I became Ryan Roxy at a pretty young age and I'm looking at you as, you know, it's no, it's, it's public record. You're Ulf, but it's Connie is the middle name. So you picked out that amazing rock and roll name and then you shortened the uh, Bloomfist last name, which is a traditional Swedish name and just became Connie Bloom. And that, to me, oozes instant rock and roller. When was it your decision to become Connie Bloom? Well, first of all, my you're right that Ulf Connie is the way... I mean, Ulf is the first one, but uh, Connie is my name. Like, no one ever said Ulf, even though it's the, it's it's there first. But So Connie was my name, and Bloomquist... I had no intention of, of changing it until the record company in America when we recorded with Bob Rock and everything and we were going to release that album. And they said, you can't have that name because nobody's going to remember it. You can't, we can't have a front man with a name like that. And I was like, like Bloomfist. Oh, Bloomfist. What's That's not a problem. But they, Bloomfist. 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 Yeah. <laughs> I think it works, man. <laughs> 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 well, I thought so too, but then they started coming up with all this weird, they wouldn't give up, so they were like, they went, uh, how about Connie James, or how about hmm, Connie Stevens, <laughs> and I'm like, oh, stop it, uh, and then after a while, I, I thought, uh, why don't I just shorten it to to Bloom, and uh, also half of my, that's, uh, you know, half of my family is Bloom as well, Except, so it, it okay. didn't feel like it was totally off so to speak so i i but i really didn't want to add something totally like alvin stardust or something you know? <laughs> <laughs> I, actually, I think connie i think connie stevens wasn't that like some sort of i think it was a 70s actress at one point she, she Had to been. <laughs> and a singer and like a variety show type of girl did anybody else in the band uh sort of get the uh record company uh, suggestion, which usually means you better do this or else uh, yeah. to change their name. Like it, it was Andy Christel, always Andy Christel. No, they they thought he should be Andy Christel. Ah, okay. <laughs> and then Nicholas Sigeval. Nicholas Sigeval. I thought that was okay, but they said no, no. It it, it should be Nick Wall. And uh, Franco Santonione, which I thought also was a cool name, like a mafioso kind of uh, name. And they, but he would be what was that? Frank Santon. No, but so, but the only one that was officially changed for the record was Connie Bloom, though, right? Yeah, they. I think they insisted on that because I was the singer. So, but I, I, right. I, I guess you know, I, I bought into the idea as long as it wouldn't wouldn't be something too silly. No, no, no. And, and then, then you had that opportunity to work with Bob Rock, and who at that time was obviously one of the biggest producers in the world. So things did work out. Going a couple, just a couple of years before that, and this is obviously going to be a few years before that, because Vic has a picture of you with your first guitar. Um, it's coincidentally enough that we had uh, Steve Hunter on our podcast last, um, last week. And you were telling me through our email exchanges this week 
that one of the first riffs that you learned how to play on guitar was a Steve Hunter written riff of uh, Sweet Jane and Lou Reed's Rock and Roll Animal album. Is that true? Uh oh, did you bring it out? Okay, here we go. Some live entertainment. We better not it get was, flagged. Uh, it was this one? <laughs> etc and right. there, was, there was this guy it's funny because my mother's sister had two neighbors um and one of them was uh, really into the technical side of things so he would build little effect pedals and and the, that sort of a, i don't know what it's called in english but like a little light light show that that moves with a with a rhythm to the music okay and so was that, that and, and was that part of your band show as well or did he what did he do it just for a hobby no he, he just it was just her neighbor and he, he had this at home and and i was like uh i had just gotten my first electric so i must have been like i don't know 13 years old or something like that so I, and it was and he brought me in he said come on check this out and then he shut the light light out and um started playing him with all these echo effects and uh, and the light started flashing I'm, <laughs> I'm not sure if there was smoke as well, but it feels like it was. <laughs> it was like in, instant um, psychedelia, you know. I was like, "Wow, man, this is this is trippy." And that's so what was, got yeah, you hooked. Yeah, I think so. I, I thought that was really cool, but but then there was this other guy who um, who was actually this guy wasn't really a guitar player, but but uh, this other guy was, and he every time I would co go to visit her. I would hear him when I came from the bus station because he had the windows open. He was playing really loud in his in his <laughs> flat. I don't don't ask me how it happened, but uh, I would all, always hear him. And uh, and he said, uh, "Come on, come on down to the rehearsal place. We're playing tonight. You can you know come with me." And it was course, the seventies. I think you could do everything a little bit louder in the seventies. I think so too. Yeah. <laughs> and I thought. <laughs> I came down to the rehearsal place and I thought it was like really loud, but I'm sure both you and me play much louder nowadays, but, but I, I was blown away and he was playing that riff and I was like, what's that? And he said, it's, it's sweet Jane from, and he had that, that rock and roll animal album. And, and so, so he, sh he showed me that riff. So that was the first uh, riff I, I, I learned on electric. I had some, uh, I had some classical uh, training before that, but, but that was the first uh, electric guitar riff, so to speak. Well, I'm so going to talk it, about your class. Apparently, you had some big classical training. I'm going to talk about that a little bit in this uh, Factor Fiction section that we have coming up. But, yeah, my first guitar was it was a – you'd be proud of that. It was a off uh, Jimi Hendrix cream-colored Strat. Now, that first guitar that you had, was it a uh, – your first electric, uh, was it a Strat-type shape as well? It was actually a, a Telecaster copy. A telecaster copy because i was uh, i was into status quo at that time so i wanted a guitar like francis you said you always want the guitar that our guitar heroes played at that point you know and i believe it yeah. that at one point i had seen you know enough people but then again i didn't get my first les paul till a bunch of years later but the reason why i got this the way i ended up selling the strat to get the explorer shape ibanez i guess it was be called it was it was called a destroyer not an explorer a destroyer at ibanez right. the reason why for that was because rick nielsen had one on uh he had it on the inner sleeve of uh budokan album see i'm not sure if, if, if cheap trick live at budokan was as big an album for uh swedes as it was for a suburban kid in the states but that album for me was a big one yeah, it was it was a big one for me too. I'm a I'm a huge cheap trick fan. Well, the thing is, you and Andy, not just being cheap trick fans, you were both Alice Cooper fans, and that's where you guys found this mutual love. Um, I didn't know this, but the song "All Lips and Hips," which is that was the thing that I I felt separated Electric Boys apart from many of the other straight ahead rock and roll bands is that you guys had a bit of funk to it a bit of swagger to it it was a little bit instead of going heads up and down boom fist gloom fist it was more like si side to side you know a little bit more of that you know yeah. um 
things that made you want to dance a little bit, if you if you will. And I did not know that 1988, they there in Sweden, you released that song first, and it was a big hit here before it became a hit in the states, right? Um, I, yeah, I think I think because the moment the song was written written and recorded and they started the, the publishing company started sending it to to the people in america and etc and everything started happen happening really fast because of that song so and then mtv of course uh was a big change uh for us so i guess you're right <laughs> my, my, my been like that but we i mean we did tour a lot in sweden before before we went to America as well. Okay. What was it that gave you that, uh, uh, see, I don't want to say funk, because I, I I guess I could say funk in the same sense that the band Extreme with Nuno Betancourt had like a, a funky type of uh, playing, but it was still very heavy guitar driven. Um, what were the bands that influenced that sort of funk uh, vibe to it? Well, first of all, I... We were always, um, or, or at least speaking for myself, I was I was a big fan of um, Undisputed Truth and uh, Betty Davis, Sly and the Family Stone, you know, that kind of stuff. But then, I mean, speaking of Aerosmith, for instance, that song Last Child from the Rocks album. Yeah, 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 that has that same vibe. You're yeah. right. And also... I mean, um, for me, if you listen, I mean, we were never a funk fan. We were a hard rock fan, but we had had a group, you know. And um, but if you listen to, I mean, most most of our heroes, like um, uh, what? I mean, basically everyone, like Jimmy and uh, Deep Purple. I mean, come taste the band. If that's not funky, I don't know what is. A lot of the <laughs> like, stuff is really funky and. I mean, so it's not, it's not like we were coming up with something totally, totally new like that. But maybe, maybe we had. I thought the thing with us was that we we were a mixture of a lot of things, so it, it ended up being something that sounded a little bit different at the time. But mm -hmm. but certainly adding adding that groove to rock music is, it's been done a lot, you know, both before and after. Well, I don't know if it was a record company decision, but you guys definitely wore. It. You definitely used it in your album titles as well, because the first one in 89, Funko Metal Carpet Ride, that was, yeah. you know, you used the word funk in there, Funko Metal Carpet Ride. And then the second album that came out, Groovus Maximus. So you had funk and groove already in there. So it was almost like, yeah, this is what we, this is what you can expect a little bit about what this album is going to sound like. Uh, yeah, I think that. Obviously, that was by purpose because we figured, okay, what what is it that separates us a little bit from from maybe some of the other bands around at the time, and and we felt that it was that kind of thing. So the first album title was just a way of saying that it had had some edge and it had had some groove and it had some uh, weird bits in it, you know. <laughs> well, there was so some, you know, what there was some psychedelic in it too, and maybe yeah. that all goes back to that dude that made the light show for you from the first time that you heard Sweet Jane. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Do you know, I meant, I meant to ask you this. Do you know if, um, speaking of Steve Hunter, is he the guy who plays the lead stuff on top of that riff, or is he, or is he the guy who actually played that riff? Yes, he, he came up with that musical uh, on Rock and Roll Animal. He came up with that whole intro musical interlude of uh, Sweet Jane. So that's him. Da, 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 da. I love that. <laughs> bit. It's really good. He wrote a couple of them. I, I mean, like I said, folks, if you if you haven't checked out last week's episode or just go on our YouTube official channel and check out all these episodes of In the Trenches, uh, Steve Hunter comes up with a lot of stuff that I didn't realize. I mean, we were talking earlier. Uh, I never knew that acoustic version of uh, Salisbury Hill or Salisbury yeah. Road. That was that was Steve Hunter as well, and um, yeah. So I mean, and there's a great song off of the Rose soundtrack that he wrote, uh, Camilla, I think it's called, and um, 
he just he just has a really great um way of a knack for writing guitar parts and there it is uh, vic putting up last week's episode of steve hunter but you know what that was last week this is this week and we are talking about connie bloom electric boys and all the bands that came after electric boys for connie um but i kind of want to close that book on of what happened on the first sort of era of electric boys because there was is that sort of old era like there you go full on uh as you can see everybody's got funk metal clothes on and then there is this uh, a bit of a break and then there's a second era which you guys are, are running strong with but what do you feel uh happened during that end of like three albums made um was it that classic tale of grunge killing the electric boys or was it just getting burnt out on the road or what happened to end that first run in a sense like you said it's a classic a classic saying like grunge killed it all but <laughs> to be honest we 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 never looked at it that way it was um i think we were always kind of like in our own little bubble so to speak doing i mean we, we were we were always pretty sure of ourselves like that like if we figured if we like what we're doing then there has to be some more people out there that likes it as well and um and then nicholas and, and franco left uh and we did the third album with with new guys in abbey road and everything felt really good it was like fresh blood you know a uh, little bit little bit heavier and then um and then when that album was going to be released the record company didn't have any money left <laughs> to promote it because <laughs> they had spent it all on the recording and we were like are you kidding i mean don't you don't you like put that in the budget uh and that's where for me that's when I just fell out. Oh, fuck! This is like this ain't going nowhere, you know. And then it ended up being a, I don't know, seventeen years or something like that since we played together with the with the original lineup before we yeah. put the band together after four and a half years with Hammer Rock. So when you were able to put out that that boy that the and them boys done swang in two thousand eleven, so yeah, you had sort of this uh, this little break, and in between there. There it is, the current lineup right now, right? Uh, well, almost. We changed guitar player. <laughs> ah. Sorry about that. But uh, uh, we've gone back to uh, Martin uh, Commander, uh, who's who played on the third album. So we're uh -huh. we're keeping it in the family. Gotcha, gotcha. Well, th speaking of that, the pedigree, the rock and roll pedigree. Um, you're in Electric Boys, and then uh, then. This is where you and I start to come in uh, contact with each other. And I'm not sure I tell this story a lot on the, on the podcast. I've told it before about the time that uh, I was in Boston at the WAAF uh, radio station. And I was in a band called Electric Angels, which was signed to Atlantic Records. And there was another band called Electric Boys that were both signed to Atlantic as well. And I think we got misplaced and we got sort of confused and we went into the main studio and then the DJs were very uh, impressed with our amazing American accents because they thought they were interviewing a Swedish band. Now, do you remember that moment when we walked out of the studio? I think it was Jonathan, the bass player and myself, we walked out going, you know, and you could see that's a little funk of metal carpet ride you could see where there might be a little bit there was a lot of velvet there was a lot of scarves could you see where there might be a little bit of confusion and i i just from your perspective of it i was kind of like for me it was like yes we got on the traffic you know <laughs> big, we, we got on the biggest radio station during the best time of the day but what happened after that? Because I never hear the after story of like when they came, when you guys actually went in, they go, oh, well, you're the band we're supposed to talk to because you're the one with a hit song. Oh, Jesus, I can't remember. 
I, I honestly can't remember. I, I can't even remember what I had for breakfast this morning. So, so many P1 oh. radio stations, Electric Boys were on. See, that's what happens. We we were grinding it out trying to get a, maybe a record, you know, our record played at 12 midnight. And you guys are like on prime time all the time. So I'll never forget that story, though. Although you oh. forgot it. <laughs> you forgot it right after it happened. <laughs> that's all right. So I want to talk a little bit about, um, because after that, there was a transition time before Electric Boys got back together with, you know, version two, if you will, um, even though it's the original OGs. Um, Ginger from the Wild Hearts, a band called Silver Ginger 5. You've known Ginger. How did you meet him? How did that whole uh, situation with jamming with him come about? I had a... Um... I had a letter sent to me, like 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 old school letter, with a you know. <laughs> it was stamped. Post the postman came and deli delivered it to me. Uh, you can see, I've been talking to um, someone uh, in UK in the record business, uh, and um, and he just wanted to put a, a a band together, and he said, "Who who who should I you know call?" Um, so he got in touch with me, and uh, and I had I had just done my solo album Psychonaut at that time, and and it, it it went okay, but there was a lot of I kind of felt a bit misunderstood because people were like, "But this this doesn't sound like Electric Boys," and I was really happy about it because I felt that I was doing something different, and so I was I was pleased with that, but. Uh, but well, let me I, ask you this, Connie. Yeah. Were, were those were those solo albums? Because um, I know that you've done um, four solo albums so far. How many of them are in English? How many of them are in Swedish? Or are they a mix of both, each one? This one uh, I'm talking about was in English. Okay, so... And, so, then, so uh, and then lately I've done two uh, albums in Swedish. Okay, so Psychonaut that was released in 1999 is uh, is that like Psychonaut Astronaut Psychonaut? Is that what it's from? Yeah. Okay, and then the okay. then the last two, two 2006 has been there done what, and 2020's Game Set Bloom. Um, those are both all in Swedish, but Psychonaut and your first 1996 uh, Titanic Truth uh, that those were in English. Yes. Yes. Okay. So, what does what does Ginger say the first time he meets you and your first time you guys jam? <laughs> the first thing he said to me when when he came into the pub was was, "We look like we should be in the same band," <laughs> 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 which we did. But uh, well, but anyway, I, I I had that cassette sent to me and. Uh, uh, I, I I remember thinking if this is just I knew he was he was a great songwriter, and I thought if this is just decent, I'll go because I wanted to go on the road and do something else. And and then I put it on, and I was I was uh, slapped in the face. <laughs> I thought I thought what the fuck this is this is not good. This is really 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 good. So. So uh, yeah, I just I just went to London to meet him, and and, uh, and then soon after we we were touring in Japan. Well, because the thing is, you already had a pretty big following yourself in the UK because the Electric Boys, one of your mainstays, was the UK, right? Yeah, I'd say UK, Sweden, and America was at that time. And to this day, can you can you still say that this is it's a it's about the same thing? Like like whenever you go to the UK, it, they're always good shows. Good, they, they remember it's uh you know, fan friendly. Yeah, it feels like that. Uh, I can't say the same thing about America because we haven't been to America for for ages. I mean, we did go for the Monsters of Rock cruise, which we're gonna do together next time, right? Yes, I mean yeah. my fingers are crossed. In, in in Sweden, they hold their thumbs or whatever you want to do. Yeah. We we do have gigs booked. 
uh, with Alice next year on the Monsters of Rock cruise, Electric Boys are going to be on that uh, cruise as well. It's going to be great. Um, there's one band, another band I wish that could be on it as well, but uh, it is a, a band that you were part of because after Ginger or right around the same time, um, you sort of, again, slide into... One of my favorite bands, Hanoi Rocks, one of our favorite in the trenches guests, Michael Monroe. Um, how did did uh, Ginger introduce you into the Han Hanoi Rocks world or did you already know those guys? How did the ha Hanoi Rocks record can come about? Because I know that you, both you and Andy came as a package deal, if you will. Yeah, I, I was in a I was in a power trio um in in the early 80s and we had we released a couple of singles uh one of them was um smoking in the boys room actually and uh well obviously Bra before. brownsville station though uh, brownsville station yeah. not motley crew exactly. inspiration that's what I, I just want to clarify that i'm sure that you guys did that version because of brownsville station and not Absolutely. the crew and uh, and the story goes that rasa brought it over because because we toured with them and he, he dug it. So he had the singer, brought it over to the States and played it to Vince. I don't know. It could be, it could be true. That, that is that, you know what? You just dropped an urban legend. So you're saying that perhaps Razzle played your version of smoking in the boys room to Vince, because obviously we know about the tragedy and that how fucked up it was, but perhaps somehow, that song, that version of that song got played for Motley Crue. Maybe. Maybe. All right. Maybe. I'm, I'm all in on the conspiracy. Why not? Yeah. <laughs> Dude, I'm gonna, I'm, you know what? I'm going to DM, like I'm going to DM Nikki and see if it's true. <laughs> I'm going to well, DM Nikki after flight. the episode. First time I was flying was uh, on that first tour. And uh, I was a bit shaky. And Rasa came and sat, sat next to me and, you know, put his arm around me like, it's going to be all right, mate. You know, don't worry about this. And, you know, let's have a drink. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he was a sweetheart. But, um, no, Ginger had nothing to do with that. It, it's because uh, I got to know the, the Hannah Rocks guys in, in the early 80s. And and even back then on that first tour, Andy was saying, oh, man, you know, we, we should play together at some time. At some point, I went to see him in in London and stay with him for a while and etc. And then uh, that was a circus, I'll bet. Yeah, it was. It was good. <laughs> it was fun. That was back in those days. London was a uh, was uh, a good town to be in as well, especially with them in it. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, but then Andy Andy called me and and said uh, asked me if I would be interested in coming over and you know. So I play and work on some songs and stuff. Right. Well, the, and and that was around 2004. You you end up uh, you end up making two albums with them. Another hostile takeover in 2005 and street poetry in 2007. Am I correct when I said that? It was. It, you're correct, but but it was really street poetry. That was a band effort. The the other one was like I felt I came in like five minutes to twelve, and they were they were just. I felt that they were just kind of being nice. That, they let you uh, plug in. They let you yeah, plug in and play a few power like chords. Play <laughs> some stuff on the album, but it was it wasn't really. I mean, it, it was pretty much finished. Let's put it that way. But but street poetry was a album where we wrote songs together and uh, arranged it together and everything. Yeah. Well, I remember there was a couple shows back in those days, right around the time of when I was moving to Sweden, and then I stopped doing with Alice for that that window of time. But we played shows together um, with you and Hanoi Rocks, me and Alice Cooper, and um, I just remember there being a very uh, festive circus around, you know, Michael you know Michael Monroe and Andy McCoy because that's that's the type of relationship they had it was it was like 
folks, if you had a salad and you wanted the perfect blend, you get oil and, and balsamic vinegar. And you notice when you put them on a plate, they never, ever really mix. <laughs> but you were right there. But when they do, it tastes great, right? So you're there in the whole sort of um, circus of it. What was your role? Are were you because you're always been kind of like I said, very laid back. You know, both you and Andy are both really have that cool vibe. Just chill, hang out. What is the shit that you saw going on during those years of Hanoi Rocks? Well, I think it's like like you said, it they're a bit like brothers or something like that. I mean, they've they've been playing, they've been through so much together and. Um, I think they're um, it's that yin yang thing. They're they're, they're, <laughs> very yin guys, yang. But they're really good together, you know, like that. Yeah. And uh, I don't know what my uh, I think you know from a guitar playing point of view, both me and Andy enjoyed playing together, and he was always really nice um, about that. He he was. He always liked that, uh, like Keith Richards says, that ancient art of weaving thing, where, you, where there's not like a rhythm guitar player and a solo guy, but where we're just playing licks and solos and mix it all together. So it was always very um, free like that, which is why I enjoyed it. I, would, I, wouldn't, I probably wouldn't have done it otherwise, but... And I know that some people said that this is like, a, you're a front man, you're a singer, why are you doing this? And But to me, it's like, um, I look at myself as a, as a team player like that, you know, and with someone like Michael, who's incredible as a front man and singer, then, uh, then for One me, the best. yeah, and for, so for me, it was like luxury to just stand back, back and enjoy my guitar sound and concentrate on and you were able to like add all these amazing parts to Andy's already written amazing parts, and then they sound great as one unit. Um, sort of my take on my years with uh, playing with Slash in the Snake Pit album, you know, there was no doubt that he was the lead guitar player, but at the same time, the, I always felt that there was a freedom for me to do my parts, whatever I wanted to do that would el actually elevate the song. And, and, you know, I know that obviously Andy has that same sort of bravado on stage. He, there's, there's, there's no doubt. I mean, can I, you know, I pay homage with half of my guitar moves to Andy McCoy when we play in uh, Alice Cooper, but you know, I, that, that live, uh, live at the marquee Hanoi rocks is one of the best live concert videos I've ever seen. Uh, to this day, one of the most energetic ones because they ha they had a great uh, combination of punk, just raw rock and roll, and really great songs. So yeah. it's cool that you you were able to be a part of that whole, you know, that whole situation for as long as you were. It was, and um, and the first time I saw him was at the uh, Basco Studio in Stockholm, and this was like early eighties up to the first album and and uh, I had seen him on, on the streets, especially Michael uh, and, you know, thinking, who the fuck is that guy? I mean, who the fuck is that? Because nobody looks like I did. I did the same thing, with, but, on, on, but only on album covers. That, because I was all the way in California and me and yeah. me and all my fucking high school buddies were like, who is this guy on this? Al who are these two guys on these album covers? Yeah. And then they they played at that place and and uh, it was it was like being you know run over by a train or something. It was something totally different. It's hard to understand for people who was wasn't there, but it was it was so different at the time. And also, I like the fact that um, as a songwriter, Andy had a lot of um, variation, a lot of different inspiration sources. You could you could hear fifties rock and roll. You could hear soul funk you could hear um, you know the clash and punk and all sorts of stuff so i, I thought they were a great band and uh great playing win for sure no doubt 
No doubt. So check it out, Connie. We're going to take a quick, quick commercial break right now from our good sponsors over at Buyer Dynamic. And then we're going to come back. If I'm having such a good time talking. Usually I would have put the commercial break much earlier in the show. But folks, thank you for hanging out in the, in the trenches today. Thanks for being in the chat room. If you are listening to us on audio broadcast, thank you again. But uh, check out and hit that subscribe button to our YouTube official channel right there. And um, we will come back with more Connie Bloom, and it's time for the people to speak, the one that got away, and never let the truth get in the way of a good story. So coming up right now, hit it, Vic. Hello, folks. Roxy here. Hope you're enjoying the podcast so far. I'm very excited today to announce our newest sponsor, Biodynamic. They produce some of the industry's very best quality microphones and headphones, and that's why they're the perfect fit right here in the trenches. You're hearing my voice today through the great TG V70 microphone. This mic is perfect for any home studio, plus I get to use it on stage. I have paired the mic with the legendary Biodynamic Studio headphones, and they're called the DT770 Pros. These are amazing for analytical listening, truly the most authentic sound experience I've ever had. So whether it's listening to a podcast or one of your favorite albums, I definitely recommend these. Treat yourself right with Biodynamic gear, the gold standard in high fidelity. Now, let's get back to the podcast. Damn. So if it does look, folks, like it, I, I've just taken a shower, no, it's just because we are experiencing in Sweden a European summer, and I am, I'm hot in here. I don't know. <laughs> are you hot where you are in Sweden, yeah. Connie? Yeah, it's summer. What can I say? Damn. Good. Damn it. Yeah, but here in the studio, it's like I'm looking pretty sweaty, I, and we don't have the budget for it for a makeup artist just yet. And uh, my wife's out drinking with her friends right now, so I have I have nobody to to pat me down or powder me up. Vic, where are you for this, man? Just shaking his head. So, is that, is, can I ask you is that a, is that your rehearsal place or where are you? It's our it's it's in the Hughes and Kentner Studios, but we call it yeah, it's our rehearsal studio here that we have in Stockholm. Right. You know, we practice at the same place where uh, where Backyard Babies practices to the left and Europe practices to the right, but we have like sort of the, the rehearsal room of a walk-in closet. That's, that's about the size of it. Okay. So, so, so Backyard Babies has this big old nice spread and they have, you know, yeah. huge everything set up. And then Europe has even a bigger control room and stuff like that. And we basically have like you know, a room, but it's all kind of, we put our in ears in and we're able to do things like this. So yeah, that's yeah. what it is right now, but that's not important. What's important is we're hanging out with Connie Bloom, lead singer, lead guitar player, front man of the band electric boys. We've been talking all about all things, uh, electric boys and everything that's coming up with their new album upside down. But now it's time for you to speak. Yes, the people to speak, because what we've done is we've collected questions over the week uh, that people wanted to ask you, Connie, if you'd be so kind to answer some of these questions. It's time for Let the People Speak. So, right out of the gate, at Kanak, K-V-D-I. At Kanak, he's one of the faithful in the chat. Thank you very much. And he's one of those ones that have helped uh, promote this week's episode. So thank you very much for doing that. His question is, what is your favorite song to play from Upside Down and why? Uh, I think it's a song called Never Again, Your Slave, because it's got the heaviest riff uh, on the album. It's one of those, every time we play that song, it just makes me want to, it just feels like... Uh, Sweden Rock Festival, you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> you just want to go and play on a big festival when you got riffs like that. Now, how many times have you guys played Sweden Rock Festival? Because that is the biggest festival. It's one of Europe's biggest festivals, but it's definitely one of the biggest festivals here in Sweden. Um, how many times have you guys done that? I have to say I don't know because I've played with Hanoi as well. I've played... Um, maybe five. Okay. It's, it's just like one of those folks, if you like, if you like beer and you just kind of like that feeling of being, yeah, 
festival. It's, it's just it's, it's it's European. It's the ultimate European festival. I think without the danger, because it feels like a very safe festival, right? I think so. It's and, and a lot of family. It has, that, it has that rumor that it's it's uh, there's not much uh, trouble going on. <laughs> We've actually played a bunch of shows together. Um, not just when I'm in Alice and you know you were in Hanoi. Um, we've played as Electric Boys, and I was, uh, I think it was either Happy Pill or Roxy 77. We both did a tour of Sweden. I think we played Gothenburg and Vesteros. Am I right? Uh, with, with, with Electric Boys, with Alice Cooper headlining, Electric Boys, Sweet Middle Spot, and then it was, I believe, either Happy Pill or Roxy 77 opening up the show. So that was a those were those were a couple shows that I really remember. I really enjoyed as well. Can, yeah. can you wait to get back out there? I mean, when's your next show out in Sweden? When's your next actually next live shows? It's sometime in uh, August, I think around 20, 21st or something like that. And then we do some there's some shows in September, October, I think. And we just have a we're just working on stuff. What's gonna happen for Europe? But nothing to confirm yet. But um, at least things are, you know, things are looking, <laughs> looking better, <laughs> much better than than uh, in a long time. And I have a, a, quite a few solo shows now coming up in July, so that's nice. Okay, hold on one time, uh, Vic. Come on the air real quick because am I the one that's uh, cut, cut, cutting out in the uh, stream, or is it, uh, or is it you guys? Because, folks, don't worry. It's just another one of those technical things that happen from time to time. Uh, Vic, if you can come on here real quick so we can sort it out, because I might yeah, you're good. the studio. Is it me that's cutting out? I guess so, because everything seems good here. Anybody okay. in the chat sing? It? I need you, Vic, to hang out with oh, boy. our guest, Connie Bloom. <laughs> I'm going to leave the studio and come right back on, okay, folks? Okay. Don't worry. We're here. I think all the soccer fans are probably uh, taking the bandwidth. Yeah, I'm sure they are actually. I mean, most I think everyone's watching that pretty much, except for the people who are here now, of course. Uh, of course. Well, Ryan usually takes a few minutes to restart. I asked him to restart before the show because I thought there might have been a little bit of a, a glitch, but I guess we can go on with let the fans ask asking questions. Oh, he's already yeah. popping back in. Do that. Let's see. Is that better? Now we can't hear you. Oh, there you are. Now. It doesn't work for me, guys. Oh, I'm good. sorry. You got to restart your whole system. Oh, man, it's a bummer. You know what, um, Connie? I apologize, yeah. but if you don't, if you if you don't mind for just two seconds, we can. Uh, that's okay. I can uh, come back on. Go restart. Is, we'll yeah, I'm going to restart. I'm going to restart. I'll be back in two minutes. I promise. <laughs> it's always something. I'm glad we did a little sound sound check yesterday. I know. I, I'm glad you're not the one causing trouble. It's it's Ryan, of course. <laughs> so far, so good. Yeah. Well, let's go on with let the people speak. Uh, yeah. Since, yeah. since uh, soccer may be the thing that's causing the issue for him. Um, Vale <laughs> underscore oh seven asks, do you play or practice any sports yourself? Uh, I I used to play tennis when I was a kid. I used to like it a lot, uh, and uh, it was like I wanted to be either a guitar player or be on board. Uh, but I was uh, I was okay, but I wasn't good enough. I didn't I didn't win the game, so <laughs> uh, which was at the same around the same time I was. Standing, you know, playing behind my neck at youth clubs and stuff. So, okay. the, the, the did your tennis was, history have anything to do with your solo album Game Set Bloom? Is that how you yeah. came up with the title? <laughs> What's that? Is that how the title came about? Yeah, it is. It's a long story. I won't bore you with it, but, but we course, have plenty of time. Ryan's gone. <laughs> there's, there's, a, there's a connection there, but the, 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 there was going to be another title, and therefore the the cover I, I just brought the tennis rack to a photo shoot just because i saw it somewhere 
we were one of those. And then we, you know, I came up with the title, and you know, uh, it was it was fun to have a little fun with the the tennis uh, theme. Awesome. Okay, let's see. Ryan may be back. The boring thing with that yeah. album that it was released on Friday, the thirteenth, thirteenth uh, of March, which is when everything <laughs> started going That's down. So I you're the cause of the album. pandemic. I released an album <laughs> and the pandemic at the same time. Wow! So yeah, it, it, uh, it was bad timing <laughs> again. That is our boy Vic taking over the show. I love it. Thank hey, you very much, Vic. You're welcome. I'm back. Don't ask me to do it ever, ever again. <laughs> no, dude, it's amazing because you know what? Dude, it's not this my thing. stuff happens. It's this is what that was almost a, one of those can't hear me, bro, can't hear you, bro moments, and everything was starting to freak out. But you know, I think we handled it. It's only because okay. it's so damn hot here in this room. It's like the Sahara right now. I need some. Is the heat causing your your internet issues? I don't know, dude. It's all right now. In the trenches right. with Vic Chalfont. I love it. Yeah, Connect. there we go. So, all right, I'm out of here. You guys cover all the questions. Thank you very much, Vic Chalfont. We are right in the middle of Let the People Speak. Our next question comes from Nicholas Lisanto, official. The favorite venue you've ever played? Do you have one? Because we were just talking about Sweden Rock. Favorite venue. Not really. It's it's hard. I mean, Sweden Rock is great, uh, of course, but it's it's more to do with the uh, with the gig gig uh, gig itself. I think sometimes you can be at a great venue and have a shitty gig, so you won't you won't bother about the venue. <laughs> oh, of course, <laughs> it's fun to play um, bigger places, but uh, I'm sure you agree with this. It's really nice to play clubs as well. This it's really intimate and sweating. And cool in, in a like a my way. studio right now. Yeah. Yeah. But let me ask you this though, is there a bucket list place in Sweden, like the Globe, for instance, or maybe Uvlius Uvlius Studio uh stadium down in you know Gothenburg? Is there any of those gigs that you've done where I said yes, check one, two? No, but uh opening up for Metallica at, at uh stadium. Stadion, as it's, as it's called, is, was was a bit of a check moment. Yeah, I would think so. Because Stadion, folks, is one of those very rare gigs that rock bands get to play ever in the history of the venue itself. So you guys got to play with, with Metallica. Oh, man, that's a big gig. Yeah. All right, Stadion at Sweden's, right in the middle of uh, Stockholm, Sweden. It's at the uh, Olympic stu Stadium there. So let's move on. Moving being that we are talking about stadiums at veil underscore oh seven dot bq asked, Do you ever practice any sports? We've done with this one already when you took your little oh, break. Okay, never mind. I will just, we, you know what? We'll we will segue Vic's answer into it. And he didn't, he was like, I don't, don't want to answer it. But what did you say? Did you do it? Did you, did you do any sports or not? Playing tennis. Tennis, okay, okay. Even though we all know that there's a huge Euro Cup game going on, and maybe that was the inspiration behind that. I see. Game set bloom. Wouldn't make it wouldn't make as much sense being game set bloom fist, would it? Exactly. <laughs> at at John Rubiart asks, being oh, did you already ask this question, Vic? I should probably predecessor this. <laughs> No, go ahead. Yeah. Being bilingual, which you are bilingual, do you have a different approach when writing English to Swedish or vice versa? I think the approach would be the same from the beginning, uh, but but there is a difference, and and that is that uh, there's a lot more words in the, in English to describe something. So, which also means that there's a lot of uh, a lot more options when it comes to rhymes. So, so, so it, in that sense, it's easier in English. But then, it's because Swedish is my is my Native main term. language. It's it's like um, it's easy to t just tell a story, and so so it's like a 
the idea the idea of the lyric and the story comes easy but you might struggle with some of the rhymes and to make it work because there's not a lot of words to to choose from that's that's the difference basically do you ever sit back and go okay i have this song this is going to be in swedish or do or i have this riff idea and i have this song for the idea for a song this is definitely going to be in english or does it when do you let it come to you whether it's going to be in swedish lyrics or when it's going to be in english lyrics i think the music is what um what decides that if i come up with a idea for a song and uh if it sounds like it should be the solo stuff for it, it sounds like electric voice, and that would that would be the decision. But then again, sometimes I come, you know, I might come up with a title in Swedish, of course, and then then that's what I will use. But somebody asked if I was gonna, I think it was Mitch Lafona actually, who said that, are, are you have you ever thought about translating or, or doing your solo albums in English? But I think it will be different to do difficult to do that because as you know there's all these sayings that you have in English and in Swedish and you just can't just translate them directly. <laughs> it just doesn't work that way. Well we so, say different uh, things like 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 I said, we cross fingers in America, you hold yeah. thumbs in, in Sweden. Um, yeah. you you kill two birds with one stone in America, you swat Two flies with one hand in Sweden. Is that correct? Is that correct? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's correct. Yeah. I, I wonder how many of those there are. I mean, I, I get it that there's certain titles that would that would translate to English or translate better in Swedish. Um, who came up with the title "For Fet For Et Fuck"? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> And was, I don't know if that would translate so well in English in 2021. No, <laughs> but you did good. It sounded, I, I understood. <laughs> <laughs> the thing was, uh, it was, uh, it was, uh, obviously this was this thing I did with the Swed we did with the Swedish comedian. Uh, and uh, we did it, we did it together pretty much. We talked about what kind of lyric it should have and blah 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 and we we just put the lyrics and the title and everything together to get uh, uh it seems like that song uh came rather quickly and it was very spur of the moment and if you guys do want to go down that youtube uh, rabbit hole uh all you have to do is um google connie bloom or electric poison like you said it was it was really a, a quick thing and um, he was like jackass way before jackass existed so and we were fans and uh, and he asked us to do something together so we figured yeah let's do that i have this riff um that um i felt it's not it's not typical i mean it's not for electric voice but he can have it <laughs> and then, <laughs> then we did that song and i went back to america and as it were in those days the facts fax machines started <laughs> <laughs> and uh and it was number one in uh, the two biggest charts with the word fuck in the in the title and, and we were like what what's yeah. going on here and a, so that i mean there's still a lot of people who who doesn't really know about electric boys but when you mentioned that song in sweden they everyone knows it's a yeah well and it's a very um it's a very heartfelt video if you know the story about Svulo and and it's it's quite it's sad it's tragic but at that video things are quite good positive light and it almost gives you a nice era of of rock and roll at that time right? it was uh, yeah i i agree i i saw it a little not not too long ago uh and i was just, i was just sitting there smiling thinking that this is actually funny uh, i mean still it's good fun that's what it was love it well i have one more question that relates to another band that you have worked with and this is comes from at nick underscore harris nine musics what was it like working with crazy licks um, i don't think i ever did 
There you go. I, that's what I love about letting the people speak. They yeah. sometimes they speak out of order, <laughs> and it's not my fault. <laughs> Damn it, Mick! Why don't we do the research on that? I'm going to blame our producer. Why not? <laughs> Shaking his head. Always the producer. <laughs> Always the producer. So, speaking of not just producers, let's speaking of stories. Uh, let's move on to a part where we say never let the truth get in the way of a good story. And I'm going to just use one of them right now because this will touch upon uh, either it's fact or it's fiction. And my question to you is number two, Vic, uh, what does Connie Bloom, the Jameson whiskey company and playing the harp all have in common, or is there nothing in common with these three things? I don't know. Can you hear me? <laughs> are you are you thinking about your answer? You tuned up to it. What's that? And, and that riff, obviously, Mark Bowen's 20, uh, 20th century boy. Um, the things that I just mentioned, Connie Bloom, the Jameson Whiskey Company, and playing the harp, that is a fact. They all have things in common. Fact, folks. Tell us the story of how that thing came around and what the hell was that? Well, I used to, it, it was pr produced by uh, Jonas Oculum, the video guy. And, the major uh, video guy, yeah, the one that's done yeah. like the huge YouTube or YouTube video and Beautiful Day and Bramstein uh, live concert videos, the, the huge guy. Yeah, Madonna and everything. But he, uh, we used to, we used to hang in this bar in Stockholm, but then he was, he was working a lot. I was, I was, playing a lot and he, he phoned me one day and said we this not there's not a chance that we can go have a beer unless we work together so would you be interested in doing a, a whiskey commercial <laughs> and i'm like oh well yeah maybe what what whiskey is it and they said jameson or jameson as they as they say and i said uh okay give me five minutes i'll call you back and i'll phone my friend who's a good drinker who likes good drink drinks uh Nale his name i said uh what what's what's up with this whiskey is any good and he, he said yeah that's that's a classic that's like what what they make uh, irish coffee with and etc so i called him back and said, okay yeah let's do it <laughs> went to london for a few days and it was all done in smoke and mirrors i looked yeah. like a you play. look very much like you know how to play uh mark bolan on harp so that is fiction the fact that you play the harp, but <laughs> it's, I, I would say it's both fact and fiction, that little uh, segment that we just had. Now, never let the truth get in the way of a good story. We're done. The one that got away, though, that's something that I want to know about. Because the one that got away, which is inspired by Stanley Gable, we ask this question every single week to our guests. And because you're a guitarist, um, it holds more truth to it for me closer to my heart uh the question is is there a piece of gear a guitar an amplifier something that you wish you still had but somehow you lost it it got stolen you had to sell it for whatever reason is there any sort of guitar or amp that you or maybe even an effect that you wish you had back funnily enough i uh, i have um a boss roland chorus chorus the the ce1 the, the big heavy one that looks like a landmine or something it's it's a grayish color and it's it's, it's called the ce1 that was the chorus unit that i first got turned on by joe satriani 
when he played in a trio band back in the Bay Area because he'd take two Marshall half stacks and plug it into that CE1. I owned one of those too. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, well, I still have it. It's it's about five meters away, actually. But uh, <laughs> but that's uh, that. And I also have like a, a, an old uh, big muff fuzz box, which uh, but I still have that. So I I didn't I actually didn't lose those. But I uh, when we were touring with Hanoi in Spain, somebody stole my Marshall head. <laughs> don't, I don't know. Just after the show, somebody just picked it up and walked out with it. Uh, That's just the know. hardest thing to steal. You can't just fit that anywhere, man. I mean, I know, you have too, to. And it's too heavy. But but it was like a uh, for Tommy Folk is on a modified amp. Um, so that that sucked. I had to phone him and tell him you have to make me a new one. But but I've been lucky like that, and um, you know, I've, uh, yeah, I've been lucky. Well, that sort that sort of dovetails into our next little segment that we have gear geeks and equipment freaks because I do want to know what you are playing these days what is your equipment of choice what's your guitar of choice and what is your amplifier of choice my my guitar choice is still my uh old strap or my my strap I have a I have a few road worn which are that's more than road worn dude that that thing is completely go, go let me see that because it looks like that's the off-white strat that i originally had but there's barely any paint left on it yeah this is a 63 this is the one i got when i was uh, 70 years old or something it was mint condition at that time <laughs> <laughs> get the fuck out you've never had that relic no it's no. just so all that paint is just gigs blood sweat Tears, Hanoi rocks. Yep, I love it. Man, that's a beautiful guitar. Uh, um, I've been using because I've had I've been a Fender and Dorsey uh, for a long time, and now uh, I had a. Uh, I've been using the road worn guitars on the road just because it's safer and, and they're actually really good. Right. So and then I'm a well, I'm a I'm a Marshall guy, like you, right? Yeah, I mean, we. I've actually all the stuff that I'm doing now, as you can see in the amps in the back, they're Hughes and Kentner, and so I, I'm, I'm taking out the on the next tour um, the uh, Hughes and Kentner line, and they're making a bunch of different types of amps. All the stuff I do online right now is done through this uh, Hughes and Kentner Black Spirit floor model. So I'm I'm very happy with the way it translates, especially when I'm putting stuff out on the live streams and stuff. Um, it's not so easy to mic up Marshalls and, and get it to translate to uh, live live streaming or even posts. So everything yeah. I do now is with the with the Hughes and Kentner. But you know, I, I've dabbled in a bunch of different and a def, bunch of different amps over the years. But yeah, the the mainstay is always that that Marshall fifty or hundred watt JCM eight hundred, and that's sort of the the gold standard. And that's what I'm trying to make the Hughes and Kentner you know, up to that level for myself. Yeah. Well, I've been, I've been changing stuff. It, it's funny. I was talking to someone about it a couple of days ago that it's like you, you have, you have a sound in your head and you, you work your way until you have it. Uh, and then, and then you play that for a year or two. And then you start thinking, hang on, wouldn't it be better with this kind of stuff? And then you start changing stuff, and then you end up with the same sound, but you, just with different things. It always goes back to your old sound of what you originally thought in the first place. It's and there's, there's a good picture of the two of you guys in the studio uh, working on maybe perhaps the new album. It was upside down. Um, let's take a quick, quick a moment to celebrate our fan of the week right now before we wrap things up connie i really appreciate you being on uh and putting up with my internet uh being a little bit shoddy for a second but uh thank god vic chalfont came to the rescue as you people that have been in the chat the whole time that we've been running this uh show i want to thank you guys week in and week out that's why we have this thing called fan of the week and guess what our fan of the week this week is, I believe it's Nicholas. Come on, Vic Chalfant. And 
And there he is. Who is it, Vic? There he is. Nick Lasanti. Vic, it is. And honestly, he played trumpet for us on this last one, promoting your show so much that he played a little bit of a trumpet piece for us to, uh, I think it was more of the, at, at the races sort of thing. So um, give Nick a big thank you and a shout out. And if you'd like to be our next uh, week's fan of the week, all you have to do is uh, promote Mr. Kyle Gass, who will be our guest next week from Tenacious D. He's putting out his own solo record. That is Kyle Gass. And guess what? There's his name right there. Perfect. Um, that's next week. But guess what? We are now heading out to the highway with Connie Bloom. And we want everyone to be able to check out uh, Connie's newest album with the band Electric Boys. That's called Upside Down. Um, for those of the people that are listening on our audio broadcast, Connie, can you tell people the best way to get in touch with you and the Electric Boys that they would like to? Sorry, I didn't hear the last question. Oh, would you would you tell everybody all your uh, contacts that you have online for um, to get in touch with you or Electric Boys? Well, it looks like uh, you got them covered there. Actually, I mean we're we're on Instagram, of course, and we got the web website electricboys.com, Facebook, Electric Boys Official. Uh, that's about it. Well. At the same time, there's at Connie Bloom. If you'd like to get in touch with at Connie personally, that's at Connie Bloom on Instagram, Connie Bloom official on Facebook, and at Twitter, at Connie Bloom 2015, which means that he established his Twitter feed in 2015. That's my guess. And, and I haven't used it since. <laughs> <laughs> well, then don't contact, don't go, don't contact Connie on his Twitter. Okay. Go for Instagram because he will. Because uh, actually, you have been uh, alive on Instagram uh, all, this whole past week. You know, it really, you really have. Um, and thank you for making this episode uh, again. Very inspiring guitarist, front man, newest album, Upside Down. When can people look forward to seeing you guys on tour and what's happening in the next uh, foreseeable few months? We start touring in in Sweden in, uh, I think it's the 20 and 21st of uh, August, which will be uh, in Höganäs, it's called down south. Uh, I don't remember all the dates, but there's like uh, we do stuff in August, September, and October. And uh, as I was mentioning before, we're looking at the situation for for Europe, and then we do this Monsters of Rock cruise in February with you guys. Great. Well. So let's hope for a really busy 2022 for both our bands, and hopefully at one point uh, we get to be back out there on the road together, and yeah. we can come up with more stories. We can uh, come up with more. Uh, there it is. There's a great uh, sort of ad for the Monsters of Rock Cruise, February 9th through 14th, 2022. Everybody, cross fingers, hold thumbs, whatever it is that you do to make sure that that happens in 2022. But we've been hanging out in 2021 with Connie Bloom. Um, any parting words that you, you've been told over the years? You've given us a few great quotes uh, today from rick nielsen as it started out with but any quotes that you sort of live by or can uh pass on to inspire others that are seeking the same thing i keep coming back to forever onwards <laughs> it's it's nothing new but i mean it's like that's what it's all about forever that's onwards it. yeah man just you can't stop you gotta move on and you know move on with things, especially during difficult times like this. I like it. Right? Forever onwards. That's the way I was thinking when my internet went completely down and south. I was just going, you know what? I will sign off. I will sign back on and we're forever onwards. <laughs> Thank you very much, Connie. Hang out for one more quick second. Everybody, thanks for hanging out on another episode of In the Trenches. You can go check out uh, Upside Down. The Electric Boys newest on electricboys.com. And uh, until next time, folks, until next week with Kyle Gass, that will be our guest. Uh, you know what to do. Enjoy the ride, folks. Have a good one. In the Trenches with Ryan Roxy.
Uh, thank you very much, man.